As I promised in the last teardown video, this teardown is going to be on an engine I absolutely, I don't like it. I'm going to say it nicely. I don't like it. I don't hate a lot of things, but I definitely don't like this. This is a 2.3 liter direct injected turbo engine found in the Mazda Speed 6, the Mazda Speed 3, and most Mazda CX-7s. And frankly, uh, first I'm going to tell you all the things I like about it. You ready? All right, now the things I don't like about it. Well, we're going to cover most of those as I tear it down because I'll show you. But these engines fail at an extremely high rate. And a lot of it has to do with their owners, uh, whether it's abuse or neglect. But uh, these are pretty poorly engineered engines. And that, this has nothing to do with how much power they'll make. They make plenty of power. They're great to drive. They have great mannerisms. Uh, and I know I've seen several of them in the four to 500 horsepower on relatively few modifications. However, as far as a reliability and an ease of working on them, two thumbs down, three thumbs down for those people with three arms. I, 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 I do not like these engines. And you know, I grew up working on Mazdas. My dad is a retired Mazda tech and I've had probably 30 or 40 Mazdas in my life. I still have a few. And I'm kind of ashamed at what they became in this era. Now, the new stuff seems to be a lot more promising. I have no idea how reliable that is, but these kind of suck. Um, I mean, so many CX-7s at IAA and at Copart, just mechanical, in-op, uh, I mean, look, tons of them. And it's not just one issue. I've seen them window blocks. I've seen them stretch chains a million times. I've seen them lose compression, bend valves from stretch chains. Um, uh, there, there are tons of rod bearing issues, oiling issues, and they're just a pain to work on. Uh, and the fact that they need work all the time, you know, if it's terrible to work on, but they never need work, it's fine. Or if they're easy to work on, but they need work all the time, that's also kind of fine. But this is both. This is terrible to work on, and you need to work on them all the time. I just, I don't love it, okay? I don't love it. So this is, I'm pretty sure it's from a uh, CX-7. I'm not 100% certain, but uh, it came in this way, uh, kind of stripped down. I have probably done 60 or 70 of these, maybe more, like a ton. And I've been doing them for, I don't know, probably 12 or 13 years at this point. Pretty much since they could have bad engines, I have had them. And the blocks used to be really crazy money. I used to get $1,000 for a bare block if it was good, which that's like 50-50. I have no idea what's wrong with this. I don't know if it spins over. I don't know if it's locked up, an oiling issue. All I know is this was a core engine. Um, you know, it came with injectors, which is nice. That'll probably pay for what I paid for the engine. And uh, the pan sell really well. Like, you know, the parts, a lot of this sells really well. So I, there's not a lot of scrap unless the part's bad, which is nice. I, I don't like throwing good parts away just because nobody needs it. But uh, I guarantee you I'm going to be throwing parts away today because there's, there's no way that this is perfect inside. There's just no way. So before I can get the valve cover off, I have to pull this out, which I guess they broke a coil somewhere along the line. Well, there's part of it. I'll get there eventually. Let's try this. Yeah. Yeah, that can go there. So now let's get the valve cover off. Just a bunch of eights. So that actually doesn't look too bad. It's not too bad at all. So one thing to note, See that shiny spot on the valve cover there? That's probably, yeah, see I can't even pick that oil varnish away. That is most definitely from the chain hitting it. Um, doesn't seem that loose now, but it could be where the engine's sitting. Uh, but I bet this chain is stretched. That's what happens to a lot of these. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is peel this timing cover off, but before we can do that, we gotta pull the crank pulley off. And if you note, there's a hole right here in the crank pulley. And there's also a threaded boss on the timing cover. And you would think, like a normal person, that, that would line up and you'd, it'd be a, some sort of tool for holding the crank pulley. But if you put a bolt through there and then put any kind of torque on it, it breaks the timing cover. 
It's a great idea. It's fantastic. Also to note, this isn't keyed. The cams aren't keyed. The crank isn't keyed. Um, I mean, it's infinitely adjustable, which is cool if you make a terrible product, but it's terrible when you have to work on it all the time. So let's go ahead and get this off. There's that threaded boss. It does line up with this, but as you can tell, that's not keyed. And this has a trigger wheel on it. So it is very important where this lines up. So now I'm gonna explain how these engines get timed because obviously with a, an unkeyed cam and crank, uh, it's, it's not really a normal process. So basically what you wanna do is before you pull that crank pulley off, you turn the engine over to where this is level and you can slide a, I think it's a quarter inch metal plate which locks this cam. On the non-turbo cars, this slides across both cams and it locks both cams in place. So you know the cam timing is right. But on a turbo car, you just lock this cam. And then you come down here and you take this 10 millimeter bolt out and there's a tool which is different for a two liter, a 2.3 and a 2.5. You pull this out and there, the tool threads into this block and it goes up against the crankshaft and puts the crankshaft in at top dead center like once you turn the crank to where it won't turn anymore you're at, to at top dead center and then you go ahead and crank everything down which it's kind of like going around the block to get next door if they had just keyed it it would be a no-brainer but they didn't do that because i guess they planned on chain stretch all right let's go ahead and get the timing cover off Okay, so I've got all the bolts out and I'm gonna pry the timing cover off. Normally when I go to check to see if the chain is stretched, you measure between the timing chain tensioner and the pad that it pushes up against, in between the body and that rubber pad. However, to do that correctly, um, you need to turn the engine to where all the slack is on the tensioner side. And I just tried to do that and the engine doesn't rotate so it's locked up which it kind of sucks because i can pretty much guarantee that crank is done however uh i'm going to talk about one of the other things i really don't like about this engine and that is where the timing cover meets the oil pan i do not understand for the life of me why the timing cover bolts this direction to the pan and on an assembly situation, it's not really that big of a deal. However, if you need to drop the pan for any reason, like to do rod bearings like these things like to chew up, or for any other reason, you have to loosen the timing cover or unbolt the transmission and back the transmission off of the engine because you can't get this out otherwise. It just doesn't fit, it's too, too tight. Whereas if the bolts ran this direction upwards, like a normal engine, you could just pull the pan off and it would be no big deal. But I guess the engineers know best, right? Well, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and tear the chain off of it, try to get the oil pump chain, which is this here, try to get that loose. Sometimes that can fight me. Sometimes I've had to hammer these and shatter them. Uh, I don't really recommend using used pumps on these things. They're not that expensive new. Same with all the timing components. Never, ever, 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 ever use used. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. It's fine, fine. All right, so before I go tearing this head apart and, and pulling the cams out of it, uh, we're gonna talk about the timing chain. And this is a really sore subject for the MZR engine they stretch chains like crazy and a lot of it has to do with the maintenance intervals but a lot of it has to do also with the fact that you have the load from the high pressure fuel pump and you have this dinky little chain i think my bicycle chain is stronger than this there's the lobe on the cam that drives that high pressure pump so normally I would not hit these with an impact. We're going to use a ratchet and then I'll come back and loosen them up with the impact. They're pretty easy to strip. I've had that happen a couple times. So I try to learn from my mistakes.
So this is where you start to check for scoring from oil starvation. Go ahead and pull these cams and we'll see if the head survived whatever caused this engine to lock up. So it may be hard to see, but as you get closer to the chain, the journals on the cam get worse. This one's pretty rough right here. I can feel big divots and this one is really bad. And this one, so it sucks. I bet this, this head is probably trashed. It's not like it has cam bearings. It just eats into the, the journals of the head. We'll go ahead and pull these cams out and inspect those, but I don't think we're gonna get too lucky here. So the journals actually don't look as bad as the cams do. They need a little attention, but I think this head is serviceable. So I'm gonna go ahead and bolt the cam caps back on, and then we'll talk about pulling the head off. Before I pull the head bolts out of this, I know some of you are gonna ask, well, why won't you pull the fuel injectors and rail out? Well, the answer is that these injectors are notorious for getting stuck in the cylinder head. And there is a special tool that has been made. It's like a little slide hammer with a fork piece where you pop them out that way. However, uh, since this engine's coming completely apart, I'm gonna run the head through the parts washer. It'll clean up most of the carbon. And then when the head is warm, uh, it is a lot easier to get those injectors out. So when I pull these engines apart, I pull the injectors out once the head has been run through the parts washer. I run the whole thing through the wash. So the bolts are 12.12 millimeter. Normally I would not use an impact on a head like this, but these bolts are very difficult to get out without an impact. And especially with the engine on a stand it, with wheels on it, it wants to roll around everywhere. So I'm just gonna use an impact. I know it's not ideal, but it will do the job. Here goes nothing. Oh, this one shouldn't leak on me. These aren't really too bad about that. Well, I'm gonna venture to say that this rust doesn't help it turn, but I don't think that is why the engine is locked up. If you caught this, you see these two shiny spots on the piston, on this cylinder and this cylinder? That's because these pistons hit the cylinder head. See how that's shiny there at the top of that crown? See how that cylinder isn't like that? And that cylinder isn't like that. But these are, which meant there was some definite piston to head contact. So this crank's gonna be sweet looking. And the only way that can happen is if the piston travels farther than it should because there's no bearing. And then this probably happened from the engine sitting around. I, you know, I, again, a lot of people store these engines outside and there's not much I can do about it. And looking at the cylinder head, we see much of the same story. The center two cylinders have marks on the combustion chamber. I know there's a head gasket on here still. Let's pull that off. You can see how this is dirty here with carbon. That's kind of normal. See how this is clean? And that one's clean. That one's dirty as well. And uh, there's actually some pock marks from some debris. So I don't really know why the pistons hit the cylinder head, but I'm gonna to venture to say it's lack of bearing and that's probably from lack of oil. Now we're gonna go ahead and flip this engine upside down and pull the oil pan. I'll show you the ridiculously over-engineered counterbalance cartridge, the crappy pickup that these engines have, and then we'll get to see how bad that crank really is and see if I can get all of the rods and pistons out because I feel like that's gonna be a challenge. All right, let's go ahead and get this pan off. It's just a ring of tens, it's pretty easy. I'm not really expecting anything like that K-series was. This will be probably not so bad. Yep, that looks pretty normal to me. Oh, oh man, the inside of that pan though. This is the substance? Yeah, that's a substance, all right, that's located in the bottom of the pan. So I can see why this thing had some oil starvation issues. That is disgusting. And it, if you could probably smell it, it's awful. The oil pickup has no screen on the end. I, I cannot fathom their reasoning. I'm sure there is one, I just, I can't understand. So this is the cartridge I was talking about. And there's actually a gear mesh that meshes between the crankshaft and the cartridge itself. And 
it just adds one more step to the timing and reassembly. Uh, it weighs a lot. It takes up a lot of oil capacity. A lot of people actually delete these, and I don't really, I haven't really heard of any major issues from doing so. And the increased capacity is always a good thing, especially on an engine that's notorious for oil starvation issues. So we're going to go ahead and take this off, and then I'm going to weigh it because I'm really curious to see what this weighs. Let's see here. Yeah, there's the gear. As you can see, this is a cast iron piece. It's pretty weighty. I threw it on my freight scale. It is 18 pounds. Just that, 18 pounds. One more wasted effort. Let's see if we can turn this crank over now that it's just a bare short block. It's gonna be a ha, yeah right. I guarantee it. Oh yeah, it does. Yes. I can get this apart. All right, let's start with the two most offending cylinders. And look how black that is. That's from heat. As you can see, the rest of the crank isn't like that. Those are, that got hot. So let's go ahead and get those out and see if I can actually get those out. Because I've had some of those so bad where I had to use an air hammer and a sledgehammer to get the rod and piston off the crank where it's just welded together. So the rod cap bolts are an E12 external Torx socket. And these are usually not too bad to get out, but they can, oh, well that wasn't very tight. That's not a good sign. <laughs> I could use a quarter drive ratchet with this. Okay, that one took a little more force. I had to use all five fingers that time. That sounds wrong. So let's buzz these out and see if we can get the rods and pistons out. So those came out really easy. Let's see how they look. Oh, there's no bearing. Well, there's kind of a bearing. You could, could you call that a bearing? You might need some tissue. It's about as thick or thin as this is. Right, let's try this one. Oh yeah, look at that. That's good. Totally reusable. So these are both chewed up beyond repair. They are, I think the technical term is smoked. They look smoked. So this crank is not any better. This is really rough. Um, I've, I've definitely seen worse. I mean, this is just what MZRs do. Uh, let's see if we can get this bearing off of here. It's like razor thin. Hopefully I don't catch some weird disease doing this. Oh, I did cut myself. Damn it. It's always something. You can see that this, this bearing's wrapped all the way around. It's spun completely. All right, last and most certainly not least. That one looks the best so far, but I haven't gotten the bearing out. Just the cap. Nope, that's bad too. Ha, <laughs> who was I kidding? So the journals on the crank for those two cylinders, they're probably borderline. I can feel them, I can see them, but they're not that bad. That could be straightened out, but it's just not worth it. I mean, the crank's trash. And look at these things, they're, these were the good ones. These are at least five times thicker than the ones that came out of the cylinders two and three. So now we're gonna see if the mains are in bad shape because if the block is good, I know it's gonna need work, but if the block is good, I will be in pretty good shape. So to get this loose, I'm probably gonna have to give the crank a little uh, nudge. Yeah, I'm gonna give it a nudge. That's the word I'm looking for. Alright, now the other side, which this is the reason I don't like working on stands. They're a little more challenging to work around, but we'll get it done. Well, oh yeah, those are pretty bad. Are you guys shocked that there's damage here? I'm not. So I knocked all the bearings out and the block actually looks good. 
it actually looks good. Like, that's amazing. It didn't spin anything. I might have a good block here. Aside from the little bit of rust in this cylinder, the bores actually look really good. I didn't see any hairline cracks. I have seen lots of these blocks cracked. Somehow, this one, it might have made it. Yeah, it's going to need a little machine work, but it's certainly not as bad as I've seen. I've seen these things window block so many times. I'm pretty content with that. So I'm going to say that was about an average MZR teardown. Sometimes I get really lucky and I get a crank and a, and a cam out of it that sells. The only one that sells is the intake cam, which drives the high pressure fuel pump. Um, and, but I got a block, you know, I, I think the block will be okay. The oil pan looks good, albeit extremely dirty. And the valve cover, timing cover, the injectors and rail. I'll be able to sell that stuff and make decent money on it, but it is no home run. And that's the case with most of these engines. And I think there's a lesson to learn here. And that is, if you wish to keep bearings in your engine, then you need to keep oil pressure. And the only way you're gonna do that is keeping proper oil level. So check your oil often if you own one of these cars. And I know there's gonna be some of you saying, well, Eric, I've, I've put 200,000 miles on my car and it's been letter perfect. I've never had any issues. Well, that may be true. And I'm not discounting the people that take great care of their cars it is possible to make anything last with proper maintenance. The problem is these engines just don't have that margin of error. You run it a couple quarts low, run it hard, and it's done. Instead of another engine making lifter noise, this one has windows and holes in the block from a rod that it didn't like anymore. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that teardown. If you want to buy MZR parts, I don't have a whole lot in stock right now. This was my last core, but I do get them in on occasion. I'll leave an email in the description, and I really hope you enjoyed watching that. I'll see you guys on the next one.